Stanford University. All right, well, welcome to Lecture 16 of CS 193P. We're getting close to the end. Uh, today we're going to cover some fun topics, um, particularly audio and video, my favorites, uh, as well as uh, how to include web views into your app and how to add settings. So let's get started. First, some announcements. Uh, a Presence 5 is due tomorrow. No. Uh, final projects. I hope everybody's underway with final projects. They're due soon. They're due in 11 days, um, a week from this Sunday, the 7th at 11.59 PM. We need you to hand in to us your code, obviously. Um, PowerPoint slides, and I'll explain this in a minute, uh, or keynote slides, I should be saying, and a README file telling us uh, you know, anything you want to you tell us about your project before we start um, marking it, reading it, handing it off, stuff like that. Uh, now, now, to talk about the demos, the day after, this is, so remember, you're handing it in on Sunday at midnight. And then on Monday at 12.15, we start demos. And it's, well, we're still trying to figure out the room. Um, but it's, you have to do a two-minute two presentation. And uh, it's very strictly enforced. You can't go over two minutes. Uh, we're going to grab the cane and pull you off stage. But uh, the, the keynote slides or PowerPoint slides that you submit to us um, with, your, with your app, with your project, we're going to include into one giant keynote file. One sec. And, um, and we're just going to run through them all. So. Um, We'll let you know the order the night before, but please make sure that that stuff's included. Do you have a question, Greg? You're not, you're not going to separate us again, are you? Uh, questions, are we going to separate us? No. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to do these slides one after another, two minutes apiece. And then at the end of the roughly hour and a half to two hours that it takes, we're going to do uh, one hour. Whatever's left over, we're going to spend mingling and talking about. People can show each other their apps. Um, you know, you can talk one on one. We may have some guests as well. Uh, that's still to be determined. So there may be some opportunities there to show off what you got. Um, one other thing that we're going to try to do and, and um, it is build all the apps and hand them out the day of. So before class, we may have a, sta a station set up um, allowing students to grab each of the apps as they come in, sync them over, so that as you're demoing, they can try them out. We're still trying to figure that out, the details on that, but uh, that's the plan. Um, so be ready. Uh, yeah, OK. That's final projects. A few other announcements. Um, so AdWorld today, AdWorld's a company that uh, helps put advertising into iPhone apps. They're going to be outside the classroom uh, after this class giving out free Jamba Juice. So go talk to them, see how they can help you. Uh, they've actually helped former students of ours, Eddie and James, who have made the Air Guitar app and the Shotgun Free app. Uh, and they're actually going to be here as well. So you can talk to them about not just, not just their advertising experience, but talk to them about you know, how, do they get it, you know, how do they go from a project in class to getting it up on the store. It's a good opportunity to kind of, well, based on where you are right now, to see where you can go with this. They've been very successful with their app. So uh, after class today, outside. So today, once again, we're going to cover some interesting topics. Uh, audio APIs, there's several different levels of audio APIs that are interesting to you. And I know some of you are already using it for different projects. Um, you may want to, you, if, you're, if you haven't thought about it already, see, see maybe how some of these could help you. Uh, video playback, if you plan on doing any video streaming or playing back any local content, I'll show you some APIs for that. Uh, how to embed some web views. So if you need to go hit HTML pages, I'll show you how to do that as well. And, um, and then settings. So if you ever need to change anything about settings, then uh, this is the way, to, the way to go. So first, let's talk about audio. And you know, there's a lot, a lot of reasons why you might want to put audio in your app. You may, want to, um, you may want to have little clicks that sound every time a user presses a button. You may want to inform the user via an alert. So if you're actually making Presence 5, uh, when a tweet comes in, you may want to pop a little message up and have it ring a bell um, or make a tweet sound. Uh, or you may want to you know, have just different sound effects that respond to user actions. You may also want to play songs, stream content, um, or you may want to record audio. And that's, that's actually a couple of students are doing that in the project. A few students are doing that in the project. So, uh, we'll show you some of the APIs for that. So the first question is, well, how do you do it? Right? And the, the short answer is, is, is it depends on the complexity of what you're trying to do. And there's different, 
there's different levels of APIs depending on how complex you want your audio operations to be. Um, you, if you need uh, only a single source of audio and you're playing short sounds, there's one API. If you have several different streams of audio playing at the same time, or if you want to, um, uh, if you want to do different things with, you know, sleeping the device and having the audio still play, if it's more of a media playback application, uh, there's APIs for that as well. Uh, but the thing to note here is that you may think you have control over the audio system, but the reality is, is that this thing is an iPod and it's more than anything else, it's a phone. So when a phone call comes in and if you're trying to play audio, the system is going to take control and say, no, right now you're not allowed to play audio. The person that's using your app is trying to talk on the phone. So you can suggest to the OS and usually you have pretty good control over what it actually does, but the OS will take over in some cases. And um, it's important to respond to that properly. And I'll show you some APIs for that as well. So the, the, under the hood, there's a technology called Core Audio. And Core Audio is it's, uh, very powerful. It's actually what's on the Mac OS for audio processing. And if those of you are familiar with the Mac, uh, a lot of the audio industry recording um, hobbyists use the Mac primarily because of the power of the core audio system. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that, but this has been broken down into several different layers for you. So again, depending on the complexity, there's different APIs. So if you're trying to do something really simple, if you're trying to play little system sounds, you would use the system sound API. If you're trying to uh, just play songs, um, you can use the AV audio player class, and that will give you some, some things like uh, scrubbing and callbacks for when playback starts and stops. Um, if you're trying to do more complex things like recording, there's the audio cue API that's available in the audio toolbox. And the audio toolbox has a whole bunch of different uh, classes and helpers for this. Um, even below that, there's something called audio units. So let's say you're trying to make something that's, uh, you know, audio process, you're trying to make a mixer that has EQs and um, reverbs and stuff like that. There's a technology called audio units that helps you build up a graph of audio processing and the audio flows through it. Uh, I'll touch on that briefly today. Uh, that's super powerful if you're trying to do anything uh, very audio intensive. And the, the last audio technology here is OpenAL. And you've all heard of OpenGL. OpenAL is the audio equivalent of that. It lets you specify audio in a, three, in a 3D space um, and it lets you, it actually renders the audio based on uh, sources and, and listeners in 3D space. So I'll talk about that briefly. But again, it all depends what you're trying to do. And most of you will be fine with the system sound APIs. Most of you will be fine with the AV audio player APIs. But let's get into it. So the first thing is, if you're trying to play short sounds, okay? and short sounds is defined as roughly less than five seconds. If you're trying to play uh, alert sounds, if you're trying to play um, button clicks, you would do this through the, um, through the system sound APIs. Um, again, it's very simple, a lot of, lots of things it won't let you do, it won't let you loop, it won't let you control the volume, the volume's controlled by the device. Uh, it plays back immediately, so there's no timing, and um, it's pretty limited in terms of the formats that it supports, but primarily AIFF is probably the one you'll use the most, but there's uh, ways to convert between whatever you have right now and whatever you need. Uh, so to, to play a short sound using the System Sound API, uh, it's, there's a couple of steps. First, you need to uh, register a sound with the OS. So you have a clip on disk, you load that clip, um, and you register with the OS as an ID, a sound ID. Um, then you play that sound, and if you want to get callbacks for when it's done, you can get those as well. Uh, so here's a couple of APIs. First, we register the sound. So I have a, a file URL, right? This is a URL in our bundle, right? These are not remote URLs. Uh, I say audio services create system sound ID. Okay, that returns an identifier. I think it's, it's essentially just an integer, but it's a system sound ID. And then whenever you want to play that sound, you just call audio services, play system sound, and it plays. Uh, again, it's not too powerful, but it probably interrupts something else. If there's another system sound playing, I believe if you say play this one, it'll play right away. Yeah. So the question is, if you enter a remote URL, will anything happen? I, 
I don't know what'll happen. It'll probably fail. I don't know if this returns an error or not, but I'm, I'm sure it won't work. So there's other APIs for that. Um, okay, so, so you've played the sound. You've registered an ID, and you've played the sound. When you're done, you have to dispose it, right? And uh, disposing it will clear up the memory. It'll tell, the, it'll tell uh, your application, your memory, that it's, it's time to dump it. Uh, of course, you want to do this whenever you don't need it anymore. And um, you can keep it around if you use it frequently. But if you get a warning, dump it. It's a local sound. You can probably regenerate it. Uh, and again, that API is audio services dispose system sound ID. And again, you're not passing in the URL. You're passing in the ID that came back from the create. And now, uh, you want to feel, if you want to feel the sound, right? You want to, like Marky Mark. I won't even go there. You guys probably don't know Marky Mark <laughs> beyond his acting career. Okay, so um, the, if you want to vibrate the phone, that actually comes through as a system sound API. And there's a, an ID that's specifically, uh, it's already set up for you. It's a constant called K system sound ID vibrate. All right? So when you say audio services play system sound with the vibrate ID, it causes the iPhone to, to, vib to vibrate. Uh, it's for a fixed amount of time. I don't know what that is fraction of a second. Um, it, says, it says here it does nothing on the touch. I thought it might do a little piezo click, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. So the question is, what's the K associated with these constants? That's actually just a convention in C. A lot of uh, C constants start with K. Somebody who couldn't spell constants probably decided that K was what they wanted. Oh, C is for, for char. Um, so K is for constant. Uh, it's just a convention. You'll see that a lot, actually, in whatever language, in whatever C based languages you use. So, um, yeah. Okay, now converting sounds. Once again, the system sound APIs use AIFF and WAVE. Um, and you may not actually be starting in these formats. So, the thing is, you, you have to do this ahead of time, but if you need to convert your sounds into AIFF so that the phone will play them, so that the system sound APIs will play them, there's actually a, um, uh, a command line tool called AF Convert that I believe gets installed with the SDK. It might actually be built into the Mac uh, that will help you do that conversion. And of course, there's all kinds of you know, audio tools on the web and uh, professional audio tools for doing this conversion, but AF Convert's the nice and easy command line one. Um, you specify your input and output. It takes all kinds of different uh, compression formats. Um, here's a little example here. So we say user bin AF convert, and we say dash F AF, I, AIFF, that's the format I want output. Um, dash D B E I 16, I want it as an in, uh, int 16 format. So that's, uh, for those of you are familiar with audio, it's a, it's a PCM 16. It's basically an array of 16 bit integers representing the sound. Uh, and then you specify your files, and there it goes. So, okay, that's the system sound API. Again, very basic. Um, we'll probably do what many of you want if you're just trying to trigger little sounds as you tap. Um, but if you want to do something a little more complex, let's say you want to play a song. Um, you want to, uh, you want to have background noise to your, a background song to your, to your application or to your graphics. Uh, you should consider, you should look at the AV audio player APIs. Again, this is a Cocoa based API. The last one was C. This is Cocoa based, uh, Objective C based. Uh, it's for playing longer sounds. You can, you can uh, only play stuff that's local. Okay? Again, this is not for remote URLs. Um, if you want remote URLs, I'll get to that. Uh, but you can loop, you can seek to different points in the, in the audio file. Um, it provides metering for free, so if you want to display in your app the levels, this all comes for free. Um, you can play several of these simultaneously, so you instantiate a few of these AV audio players, and you can play several of them. Uh, and again, it's Coco style. You use the URL, so the, you create a URL from the bundle, and then you use that to initialize it. Uh, and you can get delegate methods, de delegate callbacks for when it's done loading, when it um, finished playing, uh, when it gets interrupted. Uh, and I'll talk about interruptions in a moment. But uh, it supports a lot of different f uh, formats. So if you take a look at the lower level audio toolbox, which again I'll get to in a moment, there's a, there's a class called audio file. The, there's an API called the audio file API. That supports conversion of all kinds of different formats, MP3, uh, 
uh, MP4, I don't know, what am I, uh, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. Not Og Vorbis, if anybody asks. No Og Vorbis. So here we go. Here's an example of how we create an AV audio player. We're going to get a path from the bundle for our, our uh, local file. We're going to create a URL for it, and then we're going to say AV audio player alloc in it with contents of URL, and that creates a player for us. Uh, and then there's some very simple calls for just starting that up, stopping it, pausing it, um, play and pause. Very simple. Take a look at the headers. Uh, very useful. These are in the, I believe it's the AV Foundation framework. We can take a look at that in a moment. So, and then there's uh, delegate methods, right? So it'll tell you when playback finishes. It'll tell you when there's a decode error. So let's say your MPEG, your MP3's got some is poorly encoded. It'll tell you if it can't decode it, um, and it'll give you hooks for interruptions. So remember how I was saying that the OS, you know, has full control. Well, at least it has the decency to tell you when it's taking over. So if it's if you get a phone call in the middle of your of your song, it'll tell you, hey, I'm about to interrupt your audio, and you have the opportunity to pause. Okay. It's going to stop playing audio no matter what, but you have at least the opportunity to pause, and then when it tells you that it's done the interruption, you can resume from where you were. Uh, if you don't respond to the audio interruption and you don't pause, then I believe when the interruption is done, it'll just pick up from where you thought you would have still have been um, if you didn't do the pause. So uh, if you use these, please implement those interruption APIs. Now, another concept in the audio space on the phone is audio sessions, okay? There's, there's something, uh, the phone, the, you know, this, this iPod slash phone slash application device uh, has different ways, preset ways of playing audio. And you can, you, can, you can define your app as fitting within one of these presets, or you can do something completely different. But let's, let's talk about the presets first. Um, if, you're, if you're a game, or you're listening to a podcast and you lock the device, right? You, you have a choice as to whether you want your audio to keep playing or you want it to just pause. Um, if, you're playing a, if you're playing a game and somebody toggles the ringer switch, um, there's different behaviors you may want. You may want your audio to keep playing. Uh, you may want it to silence. Um, there's even behaviors like, what if somebody's listening to audio through iPod? Should your application take over the audio and pause the iPod, um, or should it just play on top, sounds on top of the audio? And you know, if you're doing a, let's say you're doing an app where you're like uh, playing along on a fake piano keyboard to whatever rock song you, you've downloaded, uh, you may want the audio to continue in the iPod app, and then uh, you can play your sounds on top. So you have a bunch of different choices about what it does. Again, there's some presets. So um, for example, an, an ambient sound, I believe will pause the playback when you lock the device. Uh, it's assuming that you don't want audio when you're done. Uh, media playback uh, says that even though you lock the device, the system should continue to play your audio for you. Um, if you're a recording app, you have a different behavior that you may want, uh, right? You, you don't want things like uh, text message uh, alerts to play because that's going to get recorded in your stream. Um, so, so these are different presets, and again, you use the audio session API to specify what your app actually, how your app actually behaves, and you tell the system, and it'll manage that for you. So, um, again, so some of the default sessions will tell you know should it mute other sounds, should it mute the iPod, uh, should it respect the ringer switch, um, what happens when the user locks the device, and. If you want something more fine-grained than just the presets, you can actually go in and tweak every one of these as, as different parameters. And there's a good set of 15 parameters that you can tweak, including things like sample rate and bit rate and stuff like that. So all of that is available to you. Um, but if you do nothing, the system will do what it thinks is uh, the right thing, which I believe is turn off your sound when you lock the device, uh, pause iPod if, you, if it's playing, and um, yeah, I believe that's it. So we'll actually take a, take a look at this as an example. Uh, so, so let's take a demo. I'm going to take you through some of the simple audio APIs that I just covered. All right, here we go. So um, this, 
application actually has three parts to it, which covers everything we're going to talk about in class today. You'll notice down at the, at the bottom there's three tabs, audio, video, and web. For now, let's just talk about the audio tab. Uh, so you'll see here there's a few buttons, play short sound, play long sound, skip back, skip forward. Um, let's take a look at the code. So I'm going to open up my audio view nib, and I've got these buttons that are already wired up. All right, so this play short sound goes to the play short sound command. Play long sound goes to the play long sound command. Um, skip back, skip forward. We'll take a look at those as well. So when we take a look at our audio view controller, here's what happens. Uh, here's our play short sound. So play short sound gets a resource from the bundle called twang.caff, creates a URL for it, and gets a system sound ID for it, um, and then plays that system sound right away. Um, if the sound ID, if we've already gone through this, the sound ID is already cached, so we don't have to worry about that again. Uh, let's skip the pause and play, since those are the long sound. Uh, a couple other notes I wanted to make here is that, so we, um, you know, when I hit that play short sound, it loads the sound. In my did receive memory warning here, I call dispose sound, which goes and says audio services dispose system sound ID, of course, because we're good citizens. Uh, and I believe we do that in the dialic. We do right here. So let's try that one first. So here's the play short sound. Again, I just register system sound ID and I say play. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, don't have a line out, so we're going we're gonna to mic it. So here's my short sound. Can you hear that? I don't know. So it's playing the sound. Good. Good. One more time. Oh. No? You guys miking this? All right. Well, you get the idea. Here, I'll crank it even higher. All right. So and I, actually, here, take a look at the behavior. So uh, if you can hear this, and I'll, I'll like lean in. If I keep clicking it, it interrupts the last instance of it, right? Because uh, the system sound API, once again, it doesn't do multiple streams, one sound at a time. So that's the system sound API. Now let's take a look at the, um, the long sound, right? So the long sound uses the AV audio player. Uh, and here's what we do. So I, when I press that play long sound, it calls play long sound. Um, first thing it does is it gets the path for, it's actually a podcast that we're using. Um, that's stored in the bundle. It's an MP3, right? This supports more audio types than the system sound does. Uh, it creates an AV audio player with the URL that we passed in, and it actually passes a second parameter, which is an error. Um, so, it, you know, you can check the error if you want. We're not right now. Um, and we're setting ourselves as the delegate of the AV audio player. Uh, now, so this button will then, once it's created the player, It'll check to see if the player is already playing. And if it is, it's going to toggle. It's going to pause it. Uh, if it's not already playing, which is the default case, it's going to start playback. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the other the callbacks here. Uh, audio player begin interruption. So if the system gets a phone call, it's going to uh, pause the player. And when the phone call is done, we're going to resume playback from at the point where we paused. So let's take a look at that really quick. Doo -doo -doo. Try this again. Okay, so here's play long sound. Babes Lounge number 125, August 5th, 2008. Mike. Released under a Creative Commons license ah, to there support we go. the interests of the artists. Dave's Lounge is a okay, so it's playing a sound. It's uh, much longer than five seconds. It's several minutes. Um, so I'm going to pause that for a sec, and let's take a look at these other buttons. So there's skip back and skip forward. So I told you some of the things that AV Audio Player gives you for free are metering, uh, scrubbing, uh, looping. We're going to show you what the scrubbing looks like, or the um, changing the playhead position. So when I click skip forward, it actually just sets the current time. It adds 30 seconds. Uh, and then when I say skip back, it takes the current time, subtracts 30 seconds from it, and we're moving around in the clip. So let's do that again. All right, so I'm going to skip forward here. 
Every time I click, it's 30 seconds more. Every time I click here, it's 30 seconds back. Till we're back to the beginning. Okay, so another, uh, I wanna give you, show you another uh, feature that we can get with some of this fine grain control, which is, um, you know, these are some fixed 30 second forward and back buttons. Um, we could do something a little more dynamic here. Let's add a slider and we'll make a little scrubber. So here I already have a slider set up. I'm gonna pull that in. And let's see, the slider is set up for zero to one. Okay, it's just gonna give us zero to one values. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a method. I'm gonna call it IB Action Scrub Audio ID Sender. So we can get the value off the slider. And we're going to say, um, so the slider, we're going to assume the slider is the one that's sending us the data, equals UI slider sender. And then let's say, let's set the current time of the player to the slider.value times the player.duration, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the total length of the clip and I'm scaling it from zero to one based on where that slider is. So that slider is going to, um, you know, if I pull it all the way left, it's going to be the beginning of the clip. If I pull it all the way right, it'll be the end and everything in between should, should be hooked up. So let's give that a run. Yes, I want to save. No, there are no errors. All right, we're back on. All right, so play long sound. Dave's lounge number 125. Okay. August 5th, 2008. Oh. Something's not working. Oh, you got to hook up the outlet or the uh, action. So let's drag that in there. We're going to say scrub audio. Let's run that one more time. So play long sound. Now I'm actually scrubbing through the clip. All right, so I go to the end, I go near the end. It'll end in a moment. If I go back to the beginning, it all works. And you know the metering is actually that simple as well. So let's say you had your own custom view that was a um, you know a little meter that drew uh, you know zero to one based on uh, the amplitude of the audio. Um, you really just ask you ask for the current metering value and do your draw. So. Um, that's the AV Audio Player API. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other APIs that are available to you. All right, so like the Audio, audio Toolbox, okay? There are a few options for Audio Toolbox. There's uh, the Audio File services. Audio File allows you to do all kinds of decompression, uh, compression. Um, it's actually what's under the hood for the AV Audio Player. Uh, and then there's something called Audio Q. Audio queue actually lets you uh, queue up several songs and specify which song you should be playing. Um, it's actually under the hood what, what runs the iPod. So the iPod, when you play a playlist, uh, sets up an audio queue, and then depending on which song you're on, I mean, it's just an index into this audio queue. The audio queue also allows you to do recording. So if you want to, um, uh, if you want to do recording, you, you start an audio queue, you tell it to start giving you input, um, and then every time a, a buffer gets recorded, it'll call you back and tell you to, to save it yourself. Um, there's also audio queue will let you do the network streaming, right? So if you want to specify a remote URL, you use the audio queue to do it. Uh, now audio toolbox, actually audio toolbox is, is still part of the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, audio queue is part of that. So if you want to do recording, uh, you define a callback function for recording, you start your queue, and then the queue will call you back with individual buffers. And again, the buffers are, I believe you can specify, they can be you know, short as a few milliseconds, they can be pretty long. Apparently if you make them too short, you get some performance problems. So the defaults are probably a good place to start unless you need some really fine grain control. Um, and if you want to see this in, in, in action, Take a look at the iPhone Dev Center. There's actually a whole bunch of different uh, example apps for audio, and I would encourage you to go play with them. Any questions on this before I move on? Any of the audio stuff so far? Okay. 
audio units. Okay, so this is this is the the powerful. This, this is the guts of all of the audio processing on the on the OS. Uh, if you really want to do some effects processing, if you want to do some, um, if you want a, a more fine grained control of how your audio is actually patched together, and if you think of a studio, if you think of all the wires in a studio that that hook up all the different pieces of equipment, this is exactly what you're doing, uh, though without the UI. It's all processing units. Um, so if you want to do effects, rate conversion, mixing multiple streams, uh, all that stuff is through audio units. And this is, once again, this is what is actually super powerful about Mac OS X's audio system. Uh, it's very low latency. It's what a lot of studios, probably the large majority of studios use for their audio editing for music production. Um, and it's all based on this, and it's all in your little, in your pocket, in your iPhone. So. Uh, and the last thing I want to touch on here is Open OpenAL. So OpenAL is a, a cross-platform. It's an open standard for doing audio positioning. Uh, great for games. I mean, imagine if you're writing a shoot, uh, shoot 'em up, right? First-person shooter, and um, as you move around, I don't know if you if you have an accelerometer game that as you move it changes your your view. If you can imagine that there's a, an, an audio source over there. And as you turn your head, you want the sound to pan from, not only pan from right to left, but to actually do the right thing with uh, phasing of the audio to account for your you know, separation of your head. This is a whole science. Um, you use the open AL stuff. And uh, very, very powerful for 3D stuff. You specify a buffer, a buffer, so you can have several buffers. Each buffer represents the audio content. You specify sources, which are uh, points in space. And you specify the listener, which is the position of uh, the head, right? Your head with a listener. Uh, and it models everything based on that. So take a look at openal.org for more information on that. So that's audio in a nutshell. Um, again, there's a, a lot in there. Uh, the different APIs, you'd probably be fine with the first two I mentioned. Um, but if you want more, more fine grained control, there's a ton of stuff you can do. So let's talk about video. Video is um, a little simpler than audio. There's not quite as many, well, there's, there's only one class that you can use for video. On the phone and on the iPod Touch, video is full screen. That's just the way it is. I mean, users don't want to be looking at uh, you know, tiny little embedded boxes of videos. The experience that Apple's come up with is that when you play a video, it's full screen. Uh, so, you know, there's a few things you might want to do with them. You might want to play a movie that you've embedded in your app. Let's say you've got, a, you've got some kind of how-to app, and each, each how-to video uh, corresponds to, or you've got to choose your own, own adventure, and each, uh, each video corresponds to some action that the user uh, has taken. Um, and you may want to play those. You may have some content on, on a website. So if you're going head-to-head -head against YouTube, uh, this, you, know, you can stream this content from the internet. And you might want to do cutscene animation. I don't know if, any, if anybody here uh, will remember Dragon's Lair. Is this uh, fantastic game? I loved it, at least when I was seven. And uh, everything was these little video, video clips. It was actually little animation clips. And, and as you did actions, it just played different ones. Well, you know, this might be another use for video in your app, right? Uh, so once again, videos are kind of constrained on the phone. They're always full screen. Um, you do have some flexibility. You can specify the scaling mode. Is it, um, is it scaled up to fill the screen? Is it scaled up to be letterbox? Um, is it you know, one-to-one one -one size if it fits? Uh, and then there's optional controls like scrubber and volume, play, pause. You may not want to let your user uh, play or pause your video. You may just want to play it. You know, there's five seconds. It's a cut scene. So uh, there's you know, certain controls over that. And it supports .move, which is the QuickTime native format. Supports MPEG-4, uh, M4V, and 3GP. So here's the API. So it's MP Movie Player Controller. This is not a UI View Controller subclass. This is a uh, an NS Object subclass. But it's pretty pretty simple. You um, you say in it with content a URL content URL. Um, and you specify a URL, whether that's local, whether you got it from the bundle, or whether it's a remote URL. You specify the URL. 
you just say player stop. Um, there may be a pause as well. Uh, and there's three properties. There's the background color. So if your, if your video doesn't fill the screen, what color should the background around it be? What are the letterbox colors? Uh, the scaling mode, so should it fill, should it fit? And uh, movie control mode, right? So this is the, should the user be able to get to the controls for pausing, playback, volume, stuff like that. Uh, and there's notifications that it'll give you too. So this isn't a delegate driven. Uh, there may be several listeners is the reason. Uh, but notifications will tell you when playback is going to start, right? So when the, when the file that you're trying to play is done loading and the system's ready, uh, when playback is complete, or when the scaling mode is changed. So if the user's given the controls to change scaling, you might want to react to that. So here's a little demo. Again, we're going to go back to our little, uh, our little app with all three of the view controllers in it. All right, so if I switch over to this video tab, I've got two different buttons here, play with controls, play without controls. Let me show you what they look like. So you can see by the height of this scrubber that it's a fairly simple file. If I say um, play video, there's two actions, play video with controls and play video without controls. Uh, if I say with controls, first I load the movie and I uh, turn that into a URL. And then I just say play video with URL, which calls my function here, which sets up a new movie player, sets ourselves up as a callback so we know as a, it, it, it registers us as an observer for a notification so that uh, when the movie's done, we get told about it. Uh, and it specifies a couple things about scaling mode and controls. Uh, and then it just calls play. So when I say play video with controls, it sets up the movie player, sets up the parameters and says play. If I say play video without controls, it does the same thing, passes in no to this function, uh, and then all it doesn't do is, uh, or here it says, if you said no, it fixes the scaling mode and it fixes the control mode. So let's take a look at that. Uh, actually, let's, because again, we're good citizens, this is our callback. When the movie's done playing, uh, we get did finish playing, and then we go and we dump our player. So let's run. All right. So I'm going to say play with controls here. The audio is actually less important, but if you hear it, great. Um, so check out what happens to the simulator. Right? This is the same as what would happen on the on the phone. If I say play with controls, there's my app. There's my video. When I click, I have controls. There's my scrubber. Or you need to find at least one photo you can show your parents. There's, there's an app pause, play, too. next. There's no next. Um, so that's play with controls. Now the same thing without controls. If you recall, all it does here is um, it says movie control mode sets the movie control mode to hidden. Uh, and it sets the scaling mode to fill. So we'll go back to the app here and I say play without control. And if I click, there's no controls. I have no control over the scaling as a user. I have no control over um, the playback, the timeline, the volume, stuff like that. So um, again, MP movie player controller, what was it called? MP movie player controller. Very simple. Um, take a look at the headers. There's not a lot you can do with it, but it allows you to play videos locally or from the web. Sure. So the question is, uh, in the audio case, we had delegate methods to let us know when something finished. In the video case, we're using notifications. Um, it's really an, it's an implementation detail. Now, the notifications tend to be better for, well, they are better for if you want multiple listeners. Um, the delegate, really only one person gets to know when something happens. Um, in this case, when they implemented when uh, the MP movie player controller, uh, they decided that potentially, especially since this is a you know, full screen mode that you go into, you may have several different listeners that want to respond to that. Um, in the audio case, well, here you create this as well, but in the audio case, you, know, you have a lot more control, so I would guess that the reason they did delegates is because um, 
you know, you, you created the audio player, you want to know, and then you can dispatch out. I, it's a good question. Um, different teams, different yeah, different teams, different designers. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. So does the uh, movie player controller also handle caching for internet data? The question is, does the movie player controller handle caching? Yes. So if you, um, if you say in it with content URL, that's a remote URL, uh, I believe it'll do a preload. There's, there's a callback for that. Let's look at the header really quick. So there's a, where is it, notification. Preload did finish notification. Now, I'm not sure if this gets called when, so if you, if you load something from the internet, it'll try to preload a fixed amount before it, you know, uh, it, based on the rate that it's downloading, it'll start playing at some point, right? I'm not sure if this gets called when that, um, you know, the rate of download exceeds, exceeds the rate, the, the time that's required to play, or if it gets called when it's completely done, but there's your notification. So yeah, it'll handle the caching. Yeah? So the question is, um, apps like Slingbox and NCAA have their own embedded video with their own embedded controls. And uh, the, the question is, how do they do that? Um, the answer is, I don't know. I, I would bet that what they did is, I'm just guessing here. I'm, I would bet that what they did was um, uh, you know, use the, M the movie player controller, uh, set controls to false, maybe get the view, and then put their own stuff on top of that view. I wouldn't recommend doing that. If it works for them, I congratulate them. Um, the, I wouldn't speculate too much about how they do it. Yeah, I don't know how they do it, I, unfortunately. So the question is, can you load a video on a separate thread? Um, I, I believe it's already threaded for, for you. I don't know. Um, it, it won't display until it's, you know, I'm not Because sure. this is not a blocking call, right? So M, M, if I say in it with content URL, and it's a remote URL that takes a while, I believe it, um, you know, because of these notifications, I believe it handles its own threading. And this is one of those cases like, um, you know, we talked, we talked a few lectures back about um, hiding your threading from the user. I'm pretty sure this is one of those implementations where they've done that for you. Um, particularly, you know, video is an expensive process. Whether you're getting it off the internet, whether you're getting it from disk, um, it takes a long time to, to get those frames, and I would hope that this doesn't block. I would expect this doesn't block, so. Any other questions on video? Um, it's super, you know, video is super interesting. I've seen a lot of apps in the last few months come up that are, uh, you know, how-to how apps, Slingbox, people doing their own streaming for their own um, sites. Um, and the API here is fairly simplistic in terms of what you're allowed to do, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a standard user interface that Apple presents, so. So the last content thing I'm gonna cover here is um, web views. Now, um, so there's a, there's a class called UI Web View that allows you to load HTML or web data in, a, in three different ways. One, you can specify a local HTML formatted string, and you can create a web view and say, set this local string, and it'll do the formatting properly. Uh, you can specify the, the raw data and the MIME type, and if it's a MIME type that it knows how to render, it'll render it properly. Um, or you can just give it a remote URL, a web URL, and, it'll, and the UI web view will automatically handle uh, the layout and the scaling and the presentation of that web page. Um, it's what Safari's built on top of. You've probably seen a lot of apps that use this. Um, any apps that have uh, any Facebook connectivity, there's often a web view embedded in there where uh, Facebook puts it up and you can interact with it. Um, WebKit is a open source, so, so the UI WebView sits on top of WebKit, which is an open source, uh, it's an Apple technology, a lot of, actually phones use it, a lot of browsers use it, um, a way of rendering very quickly HTML and JavaScript and other uh, web technologies, PHP, uh, stuff like that. Um, there's a simple API for loading and navigating. So once again, you, there's th just three ways to specify the content of the web view. And then there's delegate methods for saying, uh, you know, that a, a, link, a link was clicked, uh, that a page finished loading, uh, that an error occurred, stuff like that. There's also JavaScript functionality built in, but you're, 
Um, this should be fine. All right, I don't expect you to do any crazy JavaScript that, that exceeds this, but you have about five seconds of you have five seconds of execution per JavaScript, um, and ten megabytes of memory to fill that you know to use for JavaScript. So, all right, so here's the UI web view. Here's the different here are the different APIs for loading. So you allocate it, you initialize it, and then you call a load HTML string where you pass in your HTML formatted NS string. You can say load data, which is the raw NS data, or you could say load request. Okay? And we haven't seen this yet. NS URL request is actually another one of these uh, you know, threaded for the user APIs where um, you specify a URL, and it goes and under the hood, you know, threaded goes and, and uh, calls the URL and returns to you the data. So you create this NS URL request. You set it up in load request for the UI web view. And, um, and then you're, you're good to go. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So there's a few properties on the UI web view that um, you might want to set. Right? There's loading, so it'll automatically put up a loading spinner. Uh, there's can, can go back, can go forward. So if this is like a navigation website, you can use, um, you have ways to go, you know, to navigate back and forth. Um, and then there's some APIs, reload, which I'm sure you're familiar with, stop loading, go back, go forward, standard. You know Safari and and web browser APIs, uh, and then there's also uh, scales pages to fit scales page to fit, which handles the zooming, right? So you know Safari. One of the big things they touted when the iPhone came out is that you're looking at a whole web page, not this little fraction of it, and you can actually pinch in and out. So you get all that for free with UI Web View, uh, and you also get this um, detects phone numbers, which is kind of kind of cool. Where if there's uh, there's these um, recognizers for different kinds of data, and if it sees a ten-digit number, sometimes if the ten-digit number has parentheses around it, it knows it's a phone number, um, and when you click on it, it automatically tries to call. So there's some delegate methods that are interesting here. So web view did start loading, did start load, did finish load, uh, did load with did fail load with error. Uh, all of these you can get, you know, you set yourself as the delegate for the web view and then you can get called whenever any of these um, happen. You also have the ability to, um, to allow the user to actually click through. So there's a, a delegate method called should start load with request that returns a bool. And you can do things like, um, you can, if you return no, you, could, you, know, you would block the link from actually going through. Uh, and you may want to do that if you're trying to uh, limit a user to a certain uh, domain, for example. Right? If you want them only to be on Stanford, um, only on Stanford's website, you know, as you click through, if somebody tries to go take you to some external link, you can block it here. Uh, so that's that little demo, you know, web view. Once again, we'll go back to my uh, super app. Um, so if I click on this web. Actually, you'll notice it automatically loads the, the class web page. Uh, let's look at the code under the hood here. So I go to my web view controller. So this is UI view controller subclass. Uh, there's a few buttons, a back button, a forward button. Um, and let's take a look at what it does. So in view will appear, of course, UI view, yeah, view controller subclass. Uh, we create a NS URL request with the URL. And the URL is you know, created here. It's stanford.edu slash class slash cs193p slash, those of you that are smarter would know that you can just do this, cs193.stanford.edu. Um, and then you, we, so the web view is created in the nib. Let me show you that really quick. We just say load request. Okay, that's it. That's, that's what it takes to uh, go off and load this HTML page. So here's my nib. There's my files owner, which is a subclass of web view controller. Uh, and it points to a view, which if I go here, we'll see is this, where is it right there? This highlighted web view right here. Um, and of course, there's a few buttons back forward, stuff like that. Um, so this is actually all it takes to load that. Oops, that view will appear is all it takes to load that. Uh, we've set ourselves up as the uh, delegate. So if I go back to here and I take a look at the nib, um, 
we point back to the view controller as a delegate. Uh, and then there's a few messages that we respond to. So did fail load with error, uh, stops animating the loading progress indicator, uh, should start load with request. We actually have a uh, opportunity here to block. So this is the example I was trying to describe. If you, um, you know, if somebody tries to get outside Stanford.edu, we can return no, and we're actually going to we're going to play a sound. Uh, otherwise, we return y uh, yes and let it go through. Uh, did finish load, so once we're done loading, we enable the back button, status label, forward button, et cetera. So, and did start load actually is where we create the load, is where we fill in the status with loading, right? So when we start loading, we fill in with loading, we start the progress indicator, and when we're done, it goes away. Uh, and then the sound stuff you've seen before. So let's, let's give it a shot. So if I, all right. So obviously our view's already loaded. Um, again, to show you, if I hold down Option, I get the scaling for free, right? Just like in Safari. Um, there's no external links here that I know of. Uh, links. Help if I was zoomed in. And I go to Cocoa Heads. Right, so it won't let me get it won't let me get out, and that's all part of the um, should allow link to load or whatever it's called. Um, let's take a look. All right, should start load with request. That's it. That's UI WebView. Um, one thing I've had uh, we've had questions about on the uh, on the email list actually is uh, which I'm going to show you in a moment is. What if you've got, what if you don't want to do a full screen web view, right? What if you want to actually uh, take something smaller, like a table cell, and embed a link into it, right? So, you, we're, you know, we've, we've been playing with Twitter all term, and Twitter allows people to put links in their messages. Well, what if you want those messages to be linkable? Um, here's a little demo app that does that. So, if I go into... Mouse is not behaving. Um, okay, so here's a little app that I've made up. It's just a, let's pull up our nib. It's a root view controller, which is a table view controller subclass. Um, it has cells in it. Okay, the interesting part is here. I've got one cell, so number of rows in section, just one. And in cell for, cell for row at index path, here's a case where we're using web view not in a full screen mode, but we're just passing in a formatted HTML string. So uh, in my cell, I, when, when, I, when it asks me for a cell, I first create my string, which is go to, and then the HTML equivalent for a link, which is ahref, the link, and then followed by cs193p website, which should be linked to the URL. Um, in the cell, so I first I create a web view. I load HTML string, which is that string that I just, I just specified above. Um, I set myself up as the delegate, and then I add that as a subview to a cell. So I'm not doing a full page web view here. I'm embedding it into a cell. Every cell will have it, right? So every cell can have a link. Um, and then what I do, I've set myself up as a delegate. If somebody tries to click on it, um, I, I check to see what the navigation type is. Um, and if it's a link that was clicked, what I'm going to do is instead of allowing that to go through, if I just let it go through, it's going to try and load the web page in that little table view cell, right? Because it, it lets links go through. But if I override this and I say, don't let the link go through if somebody tries to click on a link, and instead, let's create a new web view controller, set the URL to uh, the link that they're trying to click, and then push that on the stack. Let's take a look at what that does. All right, so there's my table view, very, very simple. It's got one cell, and that cell has a UI web view embedded in it. And um, when I click on this link, it then pushes this new web view controller onto the stack. And because there's no title, there's no back button, but it's really still there. But again, if I do that again, there it is. And the sub view now has all of the uh, scaling. Now, I actually wonder, because I didn't specify 
didn't explicitly tell this not to have scaling. I wonder if this will do. Okay, that won't work. Right. Uh, I'm trying to do something crazy and fancy here, but okay. So I'm going to see if I could just zoom in on this. And no, the answer is no. I might have scaling turned off. But um, anyway, it's just an embedded web view inside of a table cell. So it, it allows the clicks through, and you can respond to them as you like. So that's how you would do uh, links off your Twitter if you wanted to do you know, this theoretical presence five that you don't really have to do. So that's web views. Clicking links and table cells. And the last thing I want to cover today is application settings. Right? So um, as you're building your application, you may want to provide ways for your, your, your app, your user, to customize the user experience. And you may have seen in the settings app on the phone, uh, there are, you, you may have other applications that have registered their settings with the system, and they show up in there. Um, one thing to note here about settings. Now, there's times when it's appropriate to use them. I don't, I don't doubt that. But um, Apple's very, um, they don't like preferences and settings. If, if you have a way that you think is the right way to do things, I encourage you to just do the right thing. Don't provide settings. When I'm in meetings and I suggest to bosses or, or directors that, hey, let's give this as an option to the, uh, to the user, they often smack me across the head and they say, no, just do the right thing. So um, if you don't need settings, don't provide them to the user. But if, you, if they are appropriate, this is the way to do it. And there's a, there's, a couple way, there's a couple places you can do it, right? And you've seen this in a, in a couple places, different apps on the phone. You can either provide them in the settings application. So your bundle may have uh, settings that show up in the settings app down at the bottom. Or you may have them in your app itself. So uh, you've seen the stock app, right? So if you flip over the stock app, it's got, um, it lets you add new stocks, stuff like that. Um, or of course, there's Safari. This is the opposite, where the settings are in the settings application. Um, those are more system-wide. And the question is, when do you want to do either of those? Well, if you have a setting that controls the appearance of your application, and it, you're not going to toggle frequently, but your users may want to set it up as a, just an environment, I would encourage you to put that in the settings application as a settings bundle, which we'll talk about in a moment. If you have a setting that, that users are going to change frequently, um, then put that inside your application as a separate view controller. And so if you want to do settings in the settings app, you want to create a settings bundle. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, but it gives you, and if, for in-app, you just do it your own custom ways, ways, ways we've talked about it already. Um, but a settings bundle, let's talk about that. So a settings bundle is actually just, um, it's a bundle that contains a plist. And the plist specifies a hierarchy of controls. And that hierarchy gets automatically rendered by the, uh, by the system. In, if you specify things like, I want a control that's a slider. I want a control that's a switch. I want a control that's a multi-value uh, picker. Um, and the system will handle all the, view, all the view rendering for you. It'll handle all the setup of the views. All you do is you specify this, this plist. Um, so the kinds of things that you can provide, well, you can have um, a title, right? You can have groups. So it's the group, it's the group, uh, group style table view is the default in settings. I think it's the only option. Um, your groups may have things like controls that are text fields or sliders or toggles, uh, multi-value. So if you click on a multi-value, you've seen this. If you pick a Wi-Fi network, you click on a multi-value and it goes to another page and gives you all the different options that you select, and then it backs back out. Um, and a child pane, which is um, kind of like a group, but it's a full page group, right? So instead of just a, a rounded rect in the uh, table, you can actually go to a full screen's worth of settings. So let's take a look at that really quick. We're actually going to add settings to our little application here. Um, so if I go to, we actually, we've already created a settings bundle here. And the way we did that was, we say new file, 
settings and settings bundle, right? That creates the shell for you. You don't have to do anything then but edit the root.plist. If I look at root.plist, here is a filled out settings bundle. So I'm going to expand it. Okay, what we have here is um, first we have a title, right? The title is general. We have a uh, multi-value, right? The multi-value has, uh, you should look at the, the documentation for all the different, the way that the plist is structured for each of the different controls. But uh, the multi-value has a titles group, and the titles group is localized, right? So um, for English, we call it audio, video, and web, and then we have values. And the values should one-to-one -one correspond to your titles. Uh, so 0, 1, and 2. Uh, this is the default tab in our application. Uh, and then there's a second, uh, a third entry here, which is another group, uh, which is the web. It has a title of web. And then it has a text field for default URL. And I'll show you how we're going to hook these up. So because this is already set up, I'm just going to run. The settings bundle gets automatically put in your bundle. And when the system sees applications that have that settings bundle in them, it automat automatically registers them for the settings app. So if I click on settings, there it is, AVW samples. You can specify an icon. I don't. Um, and here we go. So general, which has this multi-value. The multi-value, if I click on it, has audio, video, and web. And we have the web default URL that if I click on that, it gives me a keyboard and lets me type it in. So um, let's, let's do this default tab one first. All right. So right now, there's nothing listening to these settings. Right, I've got this settings uh, bundle that, that automatically presents this UI to the user, but when I click on anything, it actually doesn't change anything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. I'm going to run. All right, it's still the same tab. Uh, the settings actually register the same way as the user defaults register in, that we've seen in the past. So let's go to our app delegate. What I'm going to say here. When we create our, when we add our tab bar controller to our window, um, let's actually set up the default tab here. So I'm going to say uh, int so you know, tab index equals ns user defaults standard user defaults integer for key, and the key corresponds to the identifier. Or is it the key in our settings plist? So it's called default tab. And then I'm just going to say tab bar controller dot selected index equals tab index. All right, now let's run that. Now, because I've already changed it in the settings, I set it to, to uh, web. When I run, it should automatically pick it up. There it is, All right? Easy. One thing to note about preferences like this, um, well, specifically uh, saving your view, you shouldn't really do that via uh, preference. You should do that as a, uh, you should save the view when the user quits the app. Um, it's the right thing to do. The iPhone, the convention is, if the user quits your app and then comes back, they should be in the same spot that they left it. So you should do that automatically. This is for uh, presentation purposes only. Um, and now I'm going to show you the web view controller. So that second setting was the URL, right? So let's do this. Let's, um, instead of using this hard coded URL all the time, I'm going to say in a string um, path equals NS user defaults, standard user defaults, object for key. And this is. Our last preference here, which is default URL. I plug in default URL. And then what I'm going to say is um, when I create my URL, I'm going to say if I have a URL, let's do this, put it in brackets. If I have a URL, let's use the URL. If I don't have a URL, we'll go back to our default, which is the class web page. Um, and here we go. So if I, if I just run, I don't have a default URL right now. I haven't said anything. Uh, it helps if I use the right variable names. And 
Let's see, what did I do wrong? I did something wrong. But uh, instead of going through that, let's actually look at the settings. And I'll show you what happens when we set this. So if I set this to jobs.apple.com, which you should all look at, uh, especially given that we're towards the end of the course and you want to put your iPhone experience to uh, good use. So jobs at apple.com is my default web page that I set in my settings. And when I load the app, it comes up. So I think what I did wrong earlier is um, it probably had an empty path. So what I might do here is I could say path, you know, length is greater than zero. So if um, if there's actually a string there, then try and load that string. If not, then go to the default. Um, so anyway, same thing. And jobs at apple.com. So that's settings. Um, again, pretty powerful. Um, take a look at the options that are available to you for different controls. It's all specified in a plist, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, that's it. That's audio, video, and web. Um, what's that? Jamba Juice. Yeah, Jamba Juice after class outside. Let's go get our drinks. Any, any questions before we go, actually? Specifically about the final project? Demo presentations? OK. Everybody knows what they have to do? Good. Go uh, Wang on Monday. Oh, and uh, Go Wang, who's a, um, the, well, he's a Stanford prof, uh, Stanford PhD, and he's um, uh, he did ocarina and leaf trombone. He's actually doing the guest lecture on Monday, so I wouldn't miss that if you're interested in this stuff. I, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. He's made a bunch of money, so we can hear about entrepreneurship. We can hear about audio. Anyway, we'll see you guys on Monday. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.